I think probably like you, uh, or like me, your morning starts out, uh, at least in part, with brewing a pot of coffee, maybe, and turning on the news. It's usually at least part of my morning routine, but every day now, for as long as I can remember, there has been news uh, revolving around the unrest in the Middle East. But the unrest seems to grow ever closer and closer to our personal lives, closer to home. We start to see scenarios where we can envision ourselves being involved in the unrest. Uh, even yesterday, Mr. Servideo, in his update, he wrote that firearm manufacturing stocks have certainly not suffered. They're soaring because of increased demand for arms. Citizens are concerned about gun rights and protecting their families from terrorists. Now imagine having that thought in, in a realistic context uh, just even a few years ago. Uh, that citizens here in the United States are concerned about protecting them, their families from terrorists, and so they're buying uh, guns and turning to arms. He says there are some very portentous events taking place in our society all around us. Thankfully, we know that God will deliver the righteous in the day of trouble. Uh, reference to Psalm 34. And we can be at peace when God is with us and don't have to rely completely on ourselves or others. Well, I think the feeling that he talks about here, the feeling that the world is becoming more volatile uh, and more dangerous is familiar to all of us. It's becoming more familiar to all of us. And I think even though the church has some perspective on that, uh, that you certainly can feel uh, the, the general unrest in the public, uh, and especially, as I mentioned in comparison to previous decades and previous uh, times. You remember the 80s, uh, there doesn't seem to be, uh, there didn't, didn't seem to be a care in the world. Uh, the 90s was, you know, uh, pros prosperous with, uh, with the, the dot-com boom and, and all of that. We didn't think about these things nearly so much. But in the last uh, weeks and even uh, the last few years, we've started to see that there is this this unrest, and it starts to creep in closer and closer to our lives. It is getting scarier, and I think we feel more uncomfortable as well as time goes by, but there is a context. There's a context for us, and there are even lessons that we can draw from God's Word that give us comfort in the face of, of the scenarios that we see around us. They give us comfort, they give us instruction, and they give us direction. Turn with me, if you would, to Obadiah. We'll start in Obadiah. It's a small book here in, in the Minor Prophets, one of the, the Old Testament books that we, I think, rarely turn to. But again, there is a context here for the world that we live in right now. There's direction, there's instruction here that is applicable to us. So I'd like to, to take, take on that uh, 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 information, that instruction. The, the, uh, I'd like to take a look at that here in the context now as we start to move uh, in. It's been some time now since the Feast of Tabernacles almost seems like a distant memory, but we're moving forward. We're looking forward to spring, and we're looking forward to uh, the time of the spring holy days, and we should be about uh, starting to think about self-examination. Not that, that we shouldn't be thinking about that all the time. Uh, I think that is generally how you and I live our lives uh, but there is a time of the year that we're told to focus even more uh, on that. And so, so we'll start here in Obadiah 1 with an eye toward how this affects us. Obadiah 1, uh, uh, there's only one. There's only one chapter in Obadiah, but so we'll start in uh, verse 1. The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. Well, who is Edom? Who is Edom? If you'll put your, maybe your ribbon there in, in Obadiah, and we'll turn back uh, for a moment. We'll look, uh, we will come back, we'll spend the majority of the time here in Obadiah. But uh, let's go to Genesis, Genesis 25. This may be a review for some, but for some of those who are newer among us, uh, it may be new information. For those who are younger, maybe haven't reviewed this before, it's always good to go back and, and review this. We'll look at Genesis 25. We'll start in verse 27. 
Referring, uh, now speaking of Esau and Jacob, he says the boys grew and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob, and Jacob sawed uh, pottage, uh, that is, he boiled a boiled stew. He sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he, and he was faint. He was tired and hungry and thirsty. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray you, uh, with that same pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. So we see Esau's name here, uh, it was called Edom. It was changed to Edom. And Jacob said, tell, uh, sell me this day your birthright. And Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob uh, said, swear to me this day. And he swore to him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink. And he rose up and he went his way. And thus Esau despised his birthright. He didn't value the birthright that he had been given as the firstborn son of Isaac. He did not value that, and so the scripture says, in turn, he despised it. That's just the beginning. Well, actually, that's not even the beginning. This uh, animosity between these two brothers started even as far back as the womb, and, and one could argue even as far back as, uh, as uh, uh, Isaac and, uh, and Ishmael. Nevertheless, it has been a long uh, time that this animosity and this uh, enmity has occurred between these, uh, these two brothers, these twin brothers. Now, let's go back and look at a couple of different things. Turn to Numbers, Numbers 20. And we'll just look at a couple of passages here that highlight this enmity between these two brothers. Numbers 20 and verse 14. And Moses sent his messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus says, uh, your brother Israel. That's not, that's, that's, uh, that's not a stretch. That's not a figurative. These are, these are brother nations. Uh, this says, your brother Israel, uh, you know all the travail that has befallen us, how our fathers went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice. And sent an angel, and has brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of your border. Let us pass, I pray you. Uh, through your country, we will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards. Neither will we drink of the water of the, of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right nor to the left until we have passed your borders. And Edom said, uh, Edom said to him, you shall not pass by me, lest I come out against you with the sword. This is a brother nation. This, there's no question here as to the fact that they knew their identities. He, he used that in this petition to pass through the land. He said, he said this is, we're your brothers. Let us pass through your land. And they said, we're not going to take anything from you. We're not going to take advantage of you in any way. We just want passage. And they refused passage. He said, not only are you not allowed to come, if you try it, we're going to come after you with violence, with the sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, verse 19, we will go by the highway, tries it again, tries it again. He says, and if, and if my cattle drink of your water, then I will pay for it. And I, and I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. And he said, you shall not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border, wherefore Israel turned away from him. So they refused passage, just for no good reason, apparently, just for spite, just for spite. So you see that Esau not only despised his birthright because he didn't value it when it was his to be had, now it belongs to somebody else, and so they despise the birthright still, because it belongs to somebody else. Let's go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel uh, chapter 14. And we'll start in verse 47. So Saul took the kingdom over Israel, 
and fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the children of Ammon, and against Edom, and against the king of uh, Zobah, and against the Philistines. And wherever he turned himself, he vexed them. So you see this fighting, this constant fighting through all the stages uh, of Israel's history, this constant enmity with its brother Edom, or vice versa. Let's go to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 8. Second Samuel chapter 8 and verse uh, 13. And David got him a name when he returned from smiting of the Syrians in the Valley of Salt, being 18,000 men. And he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom he put garrisons, and all they of Edom became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David wherever he went. So again, you just see this constant enmity between uh, Israel and between Esau between Jacob and Esau, or Israel and and Edom. Okay, let's go back to Obadiah. So thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor, and this word rumor is more than, than it means to us today as something that may or may not be true and is spoken out of turn. This This is... A different word. This is an astonishing or an amazing announcement. This is a proclamation. Uh, this is from God. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent. This also is a different word than the one we're used to, as, as we consider ourselves being ambassadors uh, for Christ, as we heard with the, the Winter Family Weekend sermon recently. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an errand doer. This person is sent out to do an errand. Uh, But there's even a a deeper connotation here of of to bind up or to besiege. So so we have this ambassador is sent among the heathen or the the Gentile nations, uh, most likely an angel, uh, almost certainly an angel, arise you and let's rise up against her in battle. Speaking of Edom, her being Edom, let's rise up against her in battle. So, So this angel stirs up the surrounding nations. Verse, verses 1 through 14 here, just to give you a little bit of an outline. Verses 1 through 14 deal with the destruction of Edom during the day of the Lord. Okay, 1 through 14 deal with the destruction of Edom during the day of the Lord. Verse 2, Behold, I have made you small among the heathen. You are greatly despised. Remember, Esau, Edom, despised its birthright. And in turn, God has made them greatly despised. Uh, I'm drawing that connection. That's not a scriptural connection, but I I think it's interesting that God uses that same terminology. Uh, The pride of your heart has deceived you. You that dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that says in his heart, who shall bring me down, down to the ground? O oh, you that exalt yourself as an eagle, and though you set my nest, uh, though you set your nest above uh, among the stars, then will I bring you down, says the Lord. Turn to James real quick. Keep your finger in Obadiah. Turn to James. James chapter uh, four and verse ten, and just just compare. Just compare the two attitudes here. Uh, you, you exalt yourself, Edom, as, as the eagle, and you set your nest among the stars, and then I will bring you down. Verses, uh, James 4 and verse 10, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So we see a, a, a juxtaposed attitude here between uh, Edom and, and uh, those who God exalts. It's one thing to be a exalted by God, it's another thing entirely to exalt oneself. And Edom had exalted uh, himself or themselves, uh, convinced themselves that they were high and mighty, as we say today. Okay, back to Obadiah, verse 5. Remember again, we're dealing with uh, the destruction of Edom during the, the, uh, the day of the Lord. If, uh, verse 5, if thieves came to you, uh, if robbers by night, how are you cut off? 
that, that's a statement. It's a parenthetical statement, but it's a statement. It's not a question. It's not how are you cut off. It's how are you cut off. You, you are really cut off, Edom. Would they not have stolen, these thieves? Would they not have stolen until they had enough? If, if, uh, if the grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave some grapes? So he, he's saying, you know, if a thief comes in, and maybe you've been uh, bur- burglarized. Uh, if, if a thief comes in, they don't just clean you out. You don't come home and you have an empty house as if somebody came in and, and moved you out completely. So you still have things. They go for what's valuable. They go for what's valuable. They try to be quick, and they try to make a clean getaway. There are things that are still left. Uh, you might be wiped out by thieves, but you're not totally wiped out. Likewise, when, when grape gatherers go into the fields, they don't, they don't uh, get every single cluster of grapes. There are things left on the vine. But God here says, if I'm going to wipe you out, if I'm going to destroy you, it is going to be complete, utter desolation. And that's what God's saying is going to happen here uh, to Edom. Verse 6, how are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? Turn back uh, with me to uh, Jeremiah chapter 49 quickly. Again, keep your finger in in Obadiah. Jeremiah 49, this is a parallel uh, parallel prophecy uh, within the the book of Jeremiah regarding uh, Edom. It's Jeremiah 49 and verse 10. But I have made Esau bare. I have uncovered his secret places. He shall not be able to hide himself. His seed is spoiled, and his brethren, and his neighbors, and he is not. That is, he is, it it is as if he has never existed. So in Obadiah 6, that's the companion passage there. How are things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? Well, God says, you can't hide. You can't hide from me. Back to Obadiah, verse 7, All the men of your confederacy have brought you even to the border. The men that were at peace with you have deceived you and prevailed against you. They that eat your bread have laid wound under you. He's talking about his friends, talking about their allies, Edom's allies in the area. They've actually dealt treacherously uh, with Edom. And they say here, uh, they have ate, they've eaten your bread. It's a denoting friendship. They have been your allies, have been your friends, but they've laid a wound under you. That is, they have set a trap for you. They set a trap for you. There is none understanding in him. There's no understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount of Esau? Apparently, there was some level of wisdom, some level of notoriety for, uh, or fame for their wisdom. Some commentaries talk about them uh, having a gift of management or organization, those things. I don't know specifically, but it does seem to indicate here that there was a level of wisdom among Edom, but that God is going to take all of that away and take all of that away. And your mighty men, O Tim- Taman shall be dismayed at the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. That is, you have these valiant, mighty men, these warriors that cause you to feel safe and cause your pride to be swelled up. But they're going to die, and how are they going to die? They're going to die by slaughter. They're going to die by the sword. The same, the same thing that you think causes your, your greatness and your unassailability. Uh, Taman, by the way, is, uh, Taman was the grandson, the grandson of Esau. You can see that back in Genesis uh, 36. Actually, let's just go ahead. We'll just go look at it. Genesis 36. Uh, if you look at verse 8, Genesis 36, verse 8, Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Uh, Esau is Edom. 
It's very plainly spoken there. And these are the generations. So then it goes on. If you look at verse 11, the sons of uh, Eliphaz were Taman. So we have Esau's grandson uh, here, and it lists the other brothers. And then if you go down to uh, verse 34, it says, And Joab died, and Husham in the land of Temani uh, reigned in his stead. So uh, Temani is that area where they, where they lived. Uh, that area is, it's, uh, they're southeast of the Dead Sea in the area of Jordan. It's down in what we would, what we would understand to be uh, Petra, uh, which makes sense with the fact that they had their homes in the clefts of the rock and, and that they dwelt in the high places. Uh, so that all, that all makes sense and gives just a little bit of uh, uh, understanding and context for these mighty men of, of Taman, that kind of fortress area, uh, that they will be dismayed to the end, that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Verse 10. Now, verses 10 through 14, uh, Edom is condemned here for hating their brother, hating their brother Jacob, and for treating him cruelly. So, verse 10, For your violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. And the day that you stood on the other side, meaning the day that you stood and watched as things happened, you let things happen, you stood there and watched, and the day that strangers carried away captive his forces, Jacob's forces, that is, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. So you participated. You stood by and you watched and you allowed things to happen, but beyond that, you actually participated in the destruction of your brother Jacob. Verse 12, but you should not have looked on the day of your brother in that day uh, that he became a stranger. Neither should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Look at, uh, look at Psalm 137. So I flipped three pages, I've flipped uh, 20 psalms ahead. So, anyway. Okay, Psalm 137 and verse 7. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, even to the very foundations thereof. Even to the foundations. Raise it, take it down, tear it down, tear down the entire thing. This is not just animosity toward the birthright, uh, the, the, the physical promises uh, of, uh, of Abraham and, and, and Jacob, through Jacob. This is not just animosity toward Jacob. This is, this is now animosity that they say, raise it, raise it, referring to the destruction of, of Israel uh, by the Babylonians uh, in the 500s B.C. This is now risen to the level of animosity toward God and his entire plan for all of mankind, they've actually gotten to the point where they have turned their backs completely, 180 degrees out of phase of God's plan. They've rejected God's plan here. The plan is signified by that birthright promise. They have total opposition to the plan of God, which is just symbolized by the birthright. Raise it, raise it to the very foundation. The foundation referring to, of course, the, the, whole, the whole plan. Okay, Obadiah, uh, uh, verse 13. You should not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yet you should not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither should you have stood in the crossway to cut off those uh, of his that did escape. So, so they actually, this is one of those times where they, they stood uh, in the way. They stood in the way of Jacob uh, when they were being conquered. They stood in the way of them escaping. Sometimes they, 
uh, apparently were to uh, not only obstruct their escape, but actually turn them in uh, to deliver them uh, into the hands of their captors. They participated wholly in this. And not only that, they, they were uh, uh, puffed up by it, puffed up by the whole process. It made them feel strong. It made them feel proud. It made them uh, uh, infatuated with their own strength. Neither should you have stood in the crossway to cut off those that did escape. Neither should you have delivered up those that did remain in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. Okay, so here now we make a transition. Verses 15 through 21 is a vision of the day of the Lord. Verses 15 through 21 is a vision of the day of the Lord. 15 and 16 now specifically deal with judgment upon all the nations. Verse 15, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as you have done, it shall be done unto you. Your reward shall return upon your own head. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. They shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. This, the same faith that we read of, of Edom uh, before. These are those who despised the birthright. These are those who oppose God's whole plan. Compare that to Psalm 103. Psalm 103, let's look at verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord, so we just read about this utter destruction that God will give. As you drank upon my holy mountain, so shall you drink continually. That means all of the, the, the things that you perpetrated on, on uh, my people and on, uh, on my governments, uh, you will also uh, have the same done to you. You're, you're going to drink of that same cup for for. Uh, and the end of that is that it'll be as though you have never existed. So here we, we see in Psalm 103 in verse 17 a, a, very different, uh, a di- very different perspective here. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. Oh, so there's a different attitude here. This is not one of turning your back on God, but one of, of, of fearing him. Uh, and his righteousness unto his children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments and do them. The Lord has prepared his throne in the heavens, and the kingdom, his kingdom, rules over all. So you have two extremes here. So the question for us, I think, today, and, and please don't misunderstand, I'm not, I'm not comparing us or the church to Edom. But I am saying that there, there are lessons here uh, that are applicable to, to all of us, as, as the Scripture says, that, that, uh, that all, you know, all Scripture is in, in Timothy. I can't, I can't quote it. I'm going to get uh, all balled up in that. But, but you know what I'm talking about in Timothy, where he says all Scripture is good for, for sound doctrine and for teaching and for reproof. Uh, so we have these two extremes. So the question for us is, is where do we fall? And, and I'm not suggesting that, that anybody here is turning their, their back on, on God in the sense that Edom did. Edom completely outright rejected God. Of course, that's always a danger for us, and, and we should learn from that, that there, there's always a danger there. But, uh, but how much of the world have we drunk in? As it says here, how much, how much have we, where, where do we fall? Do, do we have one foot in, maybe, or one foot out? Are we kind of playing games? Do we, do we, do we, do we move always in, in the uh, direction that is in line with, with God's plan, what God wants for us? Uh, let's go back and look at Hosea. Hosea.
Go to chapter 8. It's an important question to ask as we are uh, starting to move down that road of needing to to get serious about self-examination at, at this time of year. Uh, Hosea chapter 8, uh, because in verse uh, 14, lest we think that this is not possible for us in the church. For Israel has forgotten his maker and builded temples, and Judah has multiplied fenced cities. But I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the places thereof. Israel has forgotten his maker. So can we ask ourselves that? Where, where do we fall? There are two extremes here. But where is it that we fall, and, and, and how, how do we react? Where, where do we fall in with uh, our conduct as, as what God is expecting from us? And, and how does it fit into uh, God's plan for us and for, for, for all of mankind for that matter? But we know that we are called to a specific purpose. We've got to ask that question. Have we drunk of any of these things upon God's holy mountain? the way that Edom did. Edom, of course, did it in a, in a blasphemous way and did not uh, have any desire to please God and actually rejected God. But verse 17, now, now as we go through 17 through 21, we change, we turn a corner here in, in this. This, is, this has been a pretty harsh uh, indictment uh, and conviction and sentencing of Edom. But now we turn a corner here in this prophecy and we, we get to an encouraging place because verses 17 through 21 deal with Israel being restored. Deal with Israel being restored and God's kingdom being established. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain, the Philistines, and they shall possess the field of Ephraim, and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of the host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephath. And the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in Sepharad, shall, be, shall possess the cities of the south. Turn to Amos. It's just... Find my bookmarker, should be right here behind Obadiah. Amos uh, chapter 9. The same picture here, same picture of Israel being uh, restored. It's rather vivid. Uh, Chapter 9, verse 13 Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake, overtake the reaper. And the treader of grapes, him that sows seed. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. He's talking about a time of unprecedented, unparalleled abundance and peace. A time where uh, normally where plowing is done in one season, and reaping is done in another season, and there's a space between them, that, that, that there is no space between the plowing and the reaping. That there is such abundance that as fast as you can get it in the ground, it's producing, and you're harvesting it. And it's time to, to plow it and sow it again. That time is coming. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink those, uh, the wine thereof, and shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given to them, says the Lord your God. This time has not yet been fulfilled in some People are confused about that. Some scholars don't quite understand that. This time has not yet been fulfilled, but it is coming, and you and I have been called to play a very special uh, part in that time. Verse 21, And saviors shall come upon Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. 
And brethren, this is talking about the saints of God. You know, it's, it, I think Peter said, uh, don't you know that the, that the saints will judge the, ru- the world? And, and that's what this is. Saviors or deliverers will come upon Mount Zion. We've been called to be part of this. We've been called to be these deliverers, of course, alongside with uh, Jesus Christ at his, uh, at his side as saints of the Most High God. You and I have an extraordinary calling. God has called us, you and me, through his grace and through no merit of our own, to be active participants with him in his incredible plan of salvation for all mankind. Does our conduct, does our way of life grow and come out of that knowledge, the knowledge of what God is doing? Does our conduct, does our way of life come out of uh, the role that God has invited us to play in that plan? Are we living in any way in opposition to God's plan? Is it possible that we have drunk in of the things of this world and that we have, have gotten off track, a little bit off center, a little degree, that we're in opposition to God's plan? And what will we do this week? What will we do this week to move a little bit closer in line with God's plan? Let's go back to 2 Chronicles in closing. 2 Chronicles. Chapter 7. And verse 14. Remember where it started with Edom as being uh, proud and exalting themselves. And look what God here says in verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, that would be us, we're the church of God, they shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins or their sin and, and will heal their land. Brethren, what will we do in the coming weeks as we begin looking forward to the spring holy days? What will we do to be examining ourselves? Examining ourselves whether we be in the faith.